So our next speaker is Ederson Dutra from University Federal de San Carlos. Um, he, Ederson did his um, undergraduate in Mathematica in Universidad Federal de Santa Maria and um, Maestrado in Universidad Federal de San Carlos. Then he went to do his PhD in, in Germany in Christian Albrecht University in Kiel, where he worked with um, Professor Richard Weidman. Uh, so Edison is working on uh, geometry group theory and algebraic topology, and intersection of these two fields. And today he will speak about Nielsen equivalents in Fuchsian groups. Please, welcome. Hello. Thank you very much for this, uh, describing my CV. <laughs> it was very good, sorry. <laughs> and it's even a, it's a really pleasure to be invited to talk today. It struck me by surprise, actually, when I got the invita invitation at the beginning of the year. So it's, it's a great pleasure. So thank you to the organizer, to everyone. So today I will talk about um, problem of classifying Nielsen, uh, classifying generating sets up to Nielsen equivalents in the, in the class of function groups. And this is uh, a joint work with uh, Richard Weidman from the University of Kiel. And this is the project of my, my postdoc here at the University of San Carlos and I'm, I'm founded by uh, Fapespi. So let us start with the, the very beginning. I mean, this notion of Nielsen equivalence, it's, it can be phrased in, in any group. So let's start, let's fix a group G, can be infinite, finite, anything. And let T be an n tuple or an equivalent, let's say it's an order finite subset of G. Then what we want to do is kind of modify this, this tuple in order to get something simpler. And the way we do this, at least uh, the approach we have is studying it up to Nielsen equivalence. And so uh, elementary Nielsen transformation on this tuple T, it consists in one of the following um, operations. We can replace one element by a produ product of itself with a different element, or we can replace one element by its inverse, or we can permute two elements. If you remember back from linear algebra, this is the same. This is the, actually this is not the non-commutative analog of um, this column and row of oper elementary operation on matrices that we learned back in, in, in linear algebra. So on the, where this, this n one this consists in replace one row by um, by actually, actually actually replacing one row by adding a, another one, or the, the second operation corresponds to replacing one row by a product of a non-trivial scalar. And the last one just swap two rows on the matrix. And uh, we say that uh, two tuples, they are Nielsen equivalent or simply equivalent. If I can obtain one tuple from the other by means of finally many of these operations. So in the, the idea is the same like in, uh, in, in linear art. We start out with the matrix and we perform this elementary transformation until we end up with something simpler. Simpler depends on the, on the kind of problem you have at hand. But here's the same, we start with the generates is a generating set of the group. We wanna find it, simplify it by means of this, this elementary transformations until we get something uh, that is it's, it's better to understand, let's say this way. So, but there are some kinds of data that I can, right away say, okay, this, I mean, this I, I can simplify, like the notion of reducibility on Patapo. If we say that it's reducible, if after equivalence, I can see one trivial element on it. And so what we do at this point, kind of forget this trivial element and work with this, this smaller tuple. I mean, this yeah, tuple of this form that has at least one trivial element is called stabilized. If a tuple is not re uh, reducible, say that it's irreducible. I mean, it, it cannot be simplified in this, this, this very trivial way. And so the point now, we start out with the generating set of a group. One is study Nielsen classes of, 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 of generating 
or well, inside this Nielsen equivalence class, we want to find something that is that is um, it's, it's, it's better to understand. It depends on the problem what is better to understand, but is this the point? And the bad thing that can happen for a given group is uniqueness of um, of Nielsen equivalence. I mean, for any given n, we have a unique Nielsen class of generating top of, uh, of, the, of the group. So examples of, of groups where this holds is kind of uh, the free abelian group. This is um, linear algebra, more or less, says that any generating tuple is equivalent to a stabilized um, uh, generating tuple. I mean, we have this AI to the AN, these are the standard vectors, and possibly, possibly with these trivial elements at the very end. So, I mean, for any fixed N, M, sorry, it is not necessarily the, the rank of the group, we have a unique uh, class of generating sets. But not a class of groups where this, um, this holds is the class of um, free groups. I mean, just fix a basis. I mean, a way, a way, fix a base of a free group. Let's say if you identify the free group of the fundamental group of a rose, then a natural base comes from this loops of the rows x i x to the n. Then a uh, result of Nielsen is at the very beginning of combinatorial group theory, he showed that any tuple was equ equivalent to a stabilized standard tuple. I mean, one containing this x1 to the xn with possibly some trivial elements in it. Therefore, for this class of groups, we also have a uh, uniqueness. Actually, uh, Nielsen, when he began with that, he wanted to show that any subgroup of a free group was also free. And what he did, he did this, this, this Nielsen transformation in, in some set of words until he could prove, okay, now I, I have um, a set that, that really generates the given subgroup. So the next class of groups, this is a uh, fundamental uh, group of surfaces. Here I stated for uh, orientable surfaces, but also holds for non-orientable closed surfaces. And this is due to uh, Zisha and Lauda. They prove that we also have uniqueness. I mean, they prove that any tuple is equivalent, again, to the standard tuple. Standard mean that we have this, 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 this generated from the standard presentation of the group. They prove that uh, any tuple is equivalent to the standard tuple with possibly some uh, trivial elements at the very end. So again, this shows that for any size, you have a, a unique class of generating sets. What uh, Zishan and Lauda, they work at uh, quite um, distant times. Zishan back in the 70s, he worked only for minimal generating sets of, of, this, of these groups. And his arguments were kind of uh, combinatorial, relying on this, this old method from uh, this Nielsen method of simplifying words and products and kind of controlling how long this, this, this cancellations can be. And all of this methods that Nielsen worked originally, he adapted to this setting of free products with amalgams can prove, okay, and now I can simplify until I, I, I arrive at this, this standard one. But the striking um, point about the theorem was when Laudan worked it, because he defined, uh, he worked with a different idea instead of this combinatorial language, he worked with this um, language of folding of square, square complexes, and this is a more geometric uh, way to approach the problem. And it was because of this language that we were motivated to work on, on function groups because they are simply a, a generalization thing, uh, of, of surface groups. So, but not all groups have this, this kind of uniqueness. In a way to produce uh, groups that have non-unique, uh, Nielsen classes by taking free products, for example, due to the result of uh, Grushkin Weidman. Because the theorem of Weidman, the, uh, sorry, of Grushko says that any generating tuple of a free product up to Nielsen equivalence, we can assume that this, all elements lie in one of the three factors. This is the first, this is uh, the result of Grushko theorem. Now Weidman showed that if uh, he classified in terms of 
what can we say? I mean, we have two tuples that all elements lie in one free factor. If they are equivalent, can we say that the tuples on the free factors are already equivalent? And the answer is yes. So this is this gives a way to produce um, groups with non-unique uh, non Nielsen classes. For example, if you take a group, the free product of two cyclic groups, applying now Grushka theorem to uh, uh, an arbitrary generating pair, it implies that uh, any uh, pair is equivalent to a pair containing a power of powers of the standard generators. Now, in applying Weidman theorem, we see that two tuples are pairs are equivalent if and only if they have the same power. This shows that. For generating pairs in this group, we have six distinct uh, Nielsen classes. Now, if you look at an arbitrary tuple of size bigger than three, only with Grushka theorem, we see that any generating tuple is equivalent to a stabilized standard tuple containing A and B and possibly with trivial elements. So, for this group in particular, we have uniqueness for minimal generating sets and non-uniqueness for um, arbitrary set. Uh, sorry, we have non-uniqueness for minimal and uniqueness for uh, non-minimal. So in the class of group that we work with, uh, we are uh, function groups. So in, there is this, this traditional definition of being a uh, discrete group of isometries of the hyperbolic plane. But we rather take a more geometric uh, definition as a fundamental group of an, uh, of a, an orbit fold. And an orbit fold we, we see as a uh, very combinatorial object consisting of a surface, here assuming it to be connected and orientable. This is called the, uh, orient, uh, the, the underlying surface of the orbit fold. And we have a map that to each point of the surface, it assigns an order. But we ask this, this, this subset of the points that have order bigger than one to be well behaved, to be, uh, to be well seated inside the circle and set in, in the sense that it doesn't accumulate and is contained in the, in the interior. Then the number P of X is called the order of the point. And the points that have order bigger than one, these are called the cone points of our, of our R default. So in a way to produce an orbifold as can take, take a group of isometries of, let's say, the hyperbolic plane. Here, assume it to be co-compact, but it's not necessary. Let's just take a discrete subgroup. Then the quotient space is, is a surface, an orientable surface, closed if you assume it actually to be co-compact. And on the quotient space, there's a natural orbifold structure that's to each point, we give the order of a stabilizer of some lifting of this point. This is well defined because district liftings have conjugate uh, stabilizers and the discreteness implies that uh, stabilizers are finite cyclic. So this is, this is the quotient orbit. Here, instead of A2, we could take any other surface with a, with a metric in a group of isometries of, of this surface. Then the quotient space will always be in a uh, two orbifold. Now the next notion we need is that of uh, the fundamental group of an uh, orbifold and is defined in terms of the underlying surface as follows. I mean, we first take care of, I mean, not only this, the underlying surface plays a role here, but also the cone points. And the, the fundamental group, it captures this, this, this extra data on the surface, this, this extra order of the points. So how we do it, we, we choose small disk centered at its cone points. And from the surface F, we remove this disk, then compute the fundamental group of this puncture surface and add this relation, this SI, that come from the, that correspond to the cone points. We say that this SI, they are represented by the boundary of this removed disks. Then we pose that these guys, they have finite order P2 or PI according to the order of the, the respective cone point. Now, for example, uh, it's not hard to, for in the, the first picture here, we have an animus with a single cone point. Then 
recipe that we have to compute the fundamental loop, we must remove a disk from from this um, from the around the cone point and compute the fundamental group of the, this, this, this resulting surface and add back the relation that comes from the, from the cone point. So, for example, here we will have three generators. Two of them come from the boundary components of the orbifold, T1 and T2. And the last one comes from the cone point. And this last guy, he has finite order as uh, P1. In general, if you have an orbifold O with a compact underlying surface of genus G and K boundary components, then it's not hard to see that it's the presentation of the group has generators, it's the so-called standard generators, AI, BIs, that come from the genus of the surface, the SI come from the cone points, and the TI, this guy come from the boundary components of F. And they are subject to the relations, this SI to the PIs that come from the order of the cone points, and the long relation R that comes from the surface. So this is, this, these generators I will call from now on the standard generators, and this is called also the standard presentation of this, this kind of orbifolds. In general, now, um, if you have, a, like in this discussion orbifold that you constructed before, you have a group that acts on A2 by isometries, then the fundamental group of the quotient space recovers the fundamental group of, uh, the, the group G that was acting on A2. So this gives us this, this equivalent, uh, show that the definition of being discrete subgroup of isometry is equivalent to the uh, fundamental group of this, this, this orbifolds. So the next notion about orbifolds that, that we need is uh, of an orbifold covering. This is a generalization of, uh, of coverings in, in, in the topological sense. And here we mean a simply a, a map, a continuous surjection map between the, the underlying surfaces. And first of all, this map must preserve in some sense the orders of the, cone, of, of the points. In here, I mean, preserve each point in F prime the order of this point divides the order of it, its image in, in F. This is the first condition. This is kind of uh, being, the first condition is kind of, uh, okay, this is a map between orbifolds. The second condition is that, how is the local behavior of this, uh, of this map? It says each point has got a neighborhood in which the map above this neighborhood is, um, it's kind of a product, but on each of these leaves, these disks above the, the disk on, on the space, it behaves like a map uh, z, to the CN, z, uh, z to the power Cn. This is what this equation is, is saying, okay? If you look at each leaf, at each leaf over this, this disk, this map is gonna be kind of a n to, to one map on, on, on the disk. And now look into the definition. If you take a point that's uh, is an ordinary point, this is simply the, the original definition of covering because the pre-image will be a union of this and the restriction of at to each of each of these disks is, is going to be a homeomorphism. Therefore, we see that if you forget the cone points, if you look to this space, this at will define an, an ordinary. Uh, covering between surfaces. So for example, uh, in the first uh, picture, we have a, a covering of uh, two, uh, an orbifold covering between, between two surfaces that have underlying surfaces a disk. And we see that this, 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 this local condition is satisfied because the map here around the cone point on my base orbifold, if you look at above, is exactly this map, this, this rotation n to one on the disk. And everywhere away here, we have exactly four free images. So this is uh, actually this example give us the local model of an uh, orbifold problem. In the second example, we have an orbifold whose underlying surface is uh, 
is a, is a sphere and it's got four cone points of order two. And now I'm eta describes an orbifold covering from the two torus onto this orbifold O. And how we see the map, we trace a line through the torus and rotate this line by an angle of pi. And then we see that above each cone point, there's exactly one disk, and this disk maps two to one, exactly this, this local behavior that you want. And in general, I mean, if you have uh, groups H and G of that acts on the hyperbolic plane, then construct this quotient uh, orbifolds. Then the induced quotient map between these quotient spaces, this define an, uh, an orbifold covering. So this was the first geometric notion that we need. The next one is we must generalize this notion of almost uh, of orbifold covering because we know from the theory of, of covering that orbifold coverings are also injective in that the, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between subgroups of the fundamental group of the orbifold and coverings like it happens in, uh, in the space case. But we want to see some, some, uh, some maps that are in some sense like coverings, but they are not, uh, there's not, not this correspondence between uh, subgroups and this, this sort of maps. And to this end, we found out the notion of uh, an almost orbifold covering, that this is, is, is going to be a map that is a cover except around some point on the base space, except above this point, this map will fail to be a, a covering. And the notion, uh, the, the precise definition is a continuous map between these underlying surfaces. Here, I'm not saying, not asking this map to be a surjective, just continuous. The first condition, again, we have this, this map must preserve the order of the cone points in the sense before, I mean, the order of each point in F prime divides the order of its image in F. This is the first condition. The second uh, point is now it comes the crucial difference. There exists a point in the interior of the underlying surface that has order P. It can be anything, in, it's not necessarily a cone point. And there is, exists a disk center at this cone point such that it contains only X. Not, no other cone point, possibly X is not a cone point too. And now when you look, the rest restriction of eta to this uh, surface, then it defines an orbifold covering from Q prime to Q. So this is the way, this is what I, I said, okay, away from some point in the base orbifold, this is a covering. This is what this condition means. Now the last condition: What happens above this this, this exceptional disk? This is the cone point X. This this exceptional point. This this point X you call it exceptional. This disk this is called exceptional disk. And now we must look. Okay, above this, away from it, we know that it's an is a covering. But what happens above this disk? And now the third condition says that the inverse image is a union of disks and with a circle. What is this circle? This circle is it's a boundary component of F prime. And we ask the degree of the map on this circle does not exceed the order of, of the cone point P. And on each disk DJ, the map also behaves like coverings. So it's, uh, this is the whole, the whole point. I mean, it's, it's just missing the interior points of some disk. But the difference here is that we cannot complete this orbifold O prime to obtain a covering. And this is, um, this is the crucial property. And now the last condition we say that this uh, sort of maps, this is special almost orbifold coverings, they are special. If the degree on this exceptional boundary component doesn't divide the order of the exceptional point. So for example, take a, uh, the map described in, the, in this picture, where O prime is an orbifold whose underlying surface is a torus and it's got two cone points. Now look to the map, eta. 
we say uh, this is, 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 is an ar almost arbitrary probably because we take this disk D draw here in, in gray around the cone point X1 that has order 2n plus 1. Okay, now look this map at uh, away from this disk. It's not hard to see that this defines a covering. And now above this disk D, we see that the fibers over this, this disk consists of a disk D1 and the boundary component C. And now look in the restriction of eta to D1, this is simply the identity map. And the restriction to the boundary component as degree two, and therefore is smaller and doesn't divide the order of, of the cone point. So again, I mean, if you look into the, to this, uh, the orbital O prime, there's no way to glue a disk to the boundary component so that the extension, this extending eta to this disk will define an, the whole covering. This, there's no way to do that. And so this notion, I mean, uh, we found out, we, we, we found this, this definition of almost orbital covering, it, comes, it came naturally from our work on, on, on this Snell's equivalence on doing this, this folding process. But uh, we, while we're trying to find some more applications, we found out that it already, at least implicitly, appeared in, in the, the theory of three-dimensional topology on the, on the, 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 the setting of uh, Higgard's fields, where let's say that M is, is a, is a closed orientable three manifold. Then a Higgard's PD is simply a decomposition of the manifold as a union of two handle bodies, where a handle body is, is simply a cube with some handles hanging on it. And these handle bodies, they sit inside the manifold in such a way that they all intersect along the, their boundary uh, surfaces. And it's a standard theorem of uh, three dimensional topology that each manifold has got at least one Higgs PD. And the key problem in this theory is to classify up to isotopies such splittings. And one very strong invariant of being equivalent is Nielsen equivalent in the fundamental group of, of the manifold. This is actually the, the most powerful invariant of the inequivalent. And now there's a, a very special class of, of three manifold that the so-called cycle fiber space. These are defined at, as manifold that fiber over a two-dimensional orbifold with, um, that, that admit a circle bundle over a two-dimensional orbifold. That, I mean, in other words, these are manifold that are foliated by circles. And so in some of these cipher spaces, they admit the so-called uh, horizontal Higgs splittings. And uh, the interesting that these Higgs splittings have the property that this, this splitting surface sigma, that is, is the boundary of, of this, the handle bodies, it's got a compact subsurface such that when restricting the bundle to this compact subsurface, this defines a not necessarily special, but still an almost orbifold covering, but with a slightly different um, relaxed on the definition. In that case, I mean, the degree of the map over this, uh, the boundary of the exception of this, in that case, it can be bigger than the order. It's the single difference from our definition here. So we want to then study a new class of, of this fundamental group of orbifolds. Let start out with uh, orbifolds that have boundary. But in this case, it turns out to be quite an elementary um, problem because if you look back to the standard presentation of this, uh, these groups, we see that actually the, fundam this, uh, the fundamental group of, of the orbifold or such orbifolds, it splits as a free product. In which again, I mean, we have all but one element corresponding to the boundary components that come in as our free factors of the group and all of these elements that come from the cone points. Now it's simply a matter of applying Grushka theorem. We start with an arbitrary tuple, generating tuple. Then Grushka theorem says that it, must, it, is, it is equivalent to a tuple that all elements are contained in the, uh, in the free factors. Therefore, our elements, I mean, are of, 
any tuple is, has this form up to equivalence. It is a stabilized standard generating tuple. This shows that we have um, uniqueness for non-minimal generating sets and non-uniqueness for minimal one because this non-uniqueness, it amounts to this, this powers. This is just using again to show that they are not unique, apply this the theorem from Weidman to distinguish two Anderson classes. Now, another notion that I will need to state, the theorem is that of a, a rigid generating tuple of this orbifolds, of this orbifolds with, uh, that have non-empty boundary. We say that uh, a tuple is rigid if it is not the Nielsen equivalent to a tuple that contains simultaneously one element that comes from uh, one bound, uh, sorry, that contains elements, all elements that come from, are represented by the boundary components. I mean, I don't want to simultaneously these boundary components appearing in the, in the tuple. And a better way to see it, this is okay, describing, saying in terms of this, we know that any minimal generating set is, is standard. And how can we decide that it's rigid or not? And the, the lemma says, okay, it's rigid if the powers of this, 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 this elliptic standard generating uh, elements are at least two. This is the, this is what the lemma says. So the first remark uh, means that, okay, this is trivial in, in, in orbifolds with boundary. So let us turn our attention to orbifolds that are closed I and mean, the underlying surface closed. Here, we restrict our attention to orbifolds that are large in the sense, if the underlying surface, the sphere, then we ask it to have at least four cone points. The cases that are left out, they are either this, the underlying surface is a sphere with a single cone point or, uh, or a sphere with two or three cone points. In the first two cases, this is trivial because the fundamental group is, is cyclic, it's finite cyclic. The interesting case that is left out is when we have a surface with three cone points and the fundamental group uh, of these orbifolds is they are so-called uh, the triangle groups. And now in an, another uh, ongoing uh, work as trying to understand the remaining sets of, of this kind of orbifolds. But, but in this work, we only work uh, with this, this large, let's say large orbifolds. Recall that I call the generating type standard. If it contains all uh, but minus one um, standard generators that come from the standard presentation. Here, why I only need all but one is because one of these elliptic elements can be written as a, a word in the remaining generators. Therefore, if you have all elliptic elements in the tuple, then the tuple would be reducible. So therefore, this sort of tuples here is called uh, standard. Now, what is, uh, has got to do this, this notion of almost orbifold covering with this notion of uh, this, this, this trying to classify or to understand this Nielsen classes of um, generators, uh, sets of function groups. It's kind of, let's, it's, let's look first at, at some example. Suppose that we have an orbifold O whose underlying surface is, uh, is a sphere, it's got four cone points. Three of them having order two and the last one have order four L plus one. Then this map described in the picture, this eta, it simply rotates this, this puncture torus around this axis. This defines an almost orbifold covering. Why is this almost? Because the degree of the boundary is, is two, therefore is smaller than four L plus one and does divide it. And now let us look at the generating pair T consisting of the elements S1 times S2. And the next element is S2 times S3. I mean, this, these guys are drawn here on all this, on the red curve and the green curve. And so, if first of all, the, the, the fundamental group of O prime is free with bases containing A prime and B prime. Therefore, any tuple that they take in, 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 in this group is Nielsen equivalent to the standard tuple. 
So let us take for let us take the step, then the standard double T prime. And now it's not hard to see that the induced, I mean, the, the image under the induced homomorphism of T prime is Nielsen equivalent to the turbo T that we started with. I mean, what does this example show? It shows, okay, we started with this, this generating pair and we could construct an almost orbifold covering equipped with a rigid generating double. And this double is rigid because it doesn't contain any uh, elliptic uh, element. Therefore, by, by the, the previous lemma, it must be uh, rigid. And we, we could find this deep prime such that, I mean, the idea is I could uh, realize the Nielsen class by means of a geome geometric object. I could represent the Nielsen class by means of a, a geometric object. And this is uh, very interesting because we draw some geometry to a completely algebraic problem. Uh, and now the question is, is that arises, does it always occur? I mean, is this always the case? And the theory that I could prove is that, okay, if you have a sufficiently large orbifold and uh, T is an irreducible tuple, I mean, I mean, I cannot simplify this by, I cannot get rid of some um, trivial elements, then one of the following must occur. Following must occur. Either the tuple is, um, the top is uh, standard, was Nielsen equivalent to a standard one, or if this doesn't occur, I can find this geometric representation. I can actually, I can construct an, uh, an almost orbifold covering and a rigid generating tuple of pi one of O prime such that it's Nielsen equivalent to T. So any Nielsen class of a non-standard tuple is realized by this geometric, geometric object. And this result is quite interesting, not only because of, of, its, of its nature of this, this geometric uh, appeal, but also because it generalized this, this older result by uh, Zishan and Lauda. Lauda, they, they work only for surfaces. The fundamental group of a surface is isomorphic to the fundamental group of an orbifold that has no cone points. And now we kind of work with a big, uh, uh, a bit bigger uh, class of uh, groups that I allow orbifolds that either don't have any cone point or all cone points have other two. This is quite a, a strong condition on, on, on the orbifold. But at least for this class, I can show that there is uniqueness of, uh, of uh, Nielsen classes of generating sets. And why this follows immediately is because the, the order of the points, let start with such a orbifold. We know that all points have order at most two. Now, if you look back, if you look to the theorem, it says, now uh, take an irreducible tuple, either it's standard or I can represent it by an almost orbifold covering. But in this case, there's no uh, special almost orbifold coverings because we have this, this, the order of the points are, is small because then there's no, no way to satisfy this, this non-divisibility condition that was imposed on, on, uh, to be a special almost or before COVID. Therefore, we, we get this, this uh, uniqueness. Everything must be standard or a stabilized standard tuple. But from this, uh, this theorem, something unnatural arises. First, start with a tuple it has this previous property this of, of being reducible and assuming that it's not standard. Then is this pair, I mean, this geometric uh, representation of T, of the Nielsen class of T unique? And second of all, in the theorem, we started with a reducible um, tuple. And we found this special almost of, of a covering this tuple T prime. Now we wanted to, do, work in the other direction. I start with the pi one subjective special uh, almost orbifold covering and with the rigid generating set of its fundamental group. Now we will ask, is this tuple, the associated tuple on pi one of O irreducible? 
And why this question is interesting is because up to this point, Nielsen classes have been only studied in, in the class of function groups for the minimal ones. And so far, we don't have non-minimal generating sets that are uh, irreducible. Up to, because many believe that uh, many uh, people working on this should believe that all tuples would be uh, would be reducible. All non-minimal tuples would be reducible. But this is not the, seems not to be the case. Now, what we could prove is that this is the theory, uh, the joint theory with uh, Richard Feynman, is that okay? If assume that the the, the orbifold, the underlying surface of the orbifold, is not in a sphere, we always want it to, to have genus. Then, and suppose that T is a non-standard generating uh, set of the fundamental group of O, then we could show that this pair, this representation, this, this geometric representation is actually unique. And the second theorem says, okay, it also gives a positive answer for the, the second question, that if we start with a pi one subjective, special almost or overfoot covering, and it comes equipped with a rigid generating top of the fundamental group of O prime, then the associated top, I mean, the image under the induced homomorphism this is irreducible. So at this point, I mean, this, this theorem is kind of um, uh, a way to produce many uh, non-generating sets of, of, of our function group. And now I wanna finish talking a bit about of, uh, at least uh, the underlying idea of the, of the proof. First, we start with this, uh, this orbifold. And the, the hypothesis that this is the underlying surface is not the sphere implies that we can decompose the orbifold as a union of either orbifolds of this type, as an annulus with a single cone point, or a pair of bands. Now I use this decomposition. The idea is to use uh, the Van Kamp theorem to compute the fundamental group, to just decompose the fun fundamental group of the orbifold. Now the decomposition of the orbifold along this, 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 this curves gives rise to a graph of orbifolds. I mean, where the vertices are the components after cutting off uh, these curves and the edge spaces are the schema eyes. And having this graph of orbifolds, we can then compute fundamental group of the vertex orbifold and obtain a graph of groups. And now the advantage of this uh, decomposition of, of this language is that we can use, uh, first of all, there's many structure uh, theorems on graph of groups and the fundamental group of graph groups. And most importantly is that we have the notion of foldings of morphisms um, between graph of groups. And these foldings that are um, closely related with Nielsen transformations. Actually, uh, there's a um, recent work by uh, Wade. He pre-proves this, this, this old theorems of uh, Nielsen using the language of foldings in the setting of graphs, the scaling foldings. And now the proof uh, consists of the following. Everything, I mean, this, all this, this geometric notions of almost obvious coverings and coverings, this can be translated to morphisms over the graph of groups A. This graph of groups is the one associated to the orbifold that comes from the decomposition of O. Now we look at this uh, the morphisms phi over A that somehow they can fold uh, onto uh, special almost orbifold covers. And each of these morphisms, it comes equipped with a generating top of the fundamental group of B, of the, the graph of groups B. And we wanted, I mean, the idea is that this, this graph, the vertices, they kind of parameterize the Nielsen class of T by means of these morphisms. And the edge is set consists of, I mean, now we have two vertices joined by an edge. If one vertex is obtained from the other by means of a fold, in the key property, I mean, in going from one vertex to the other one, we always preserve this, this, this Nielsen class. And furthermore, we can see what happens 
after a fold. What we can say, I mean, when it comes to Wilson equivalence about this tuple, when you modify the, the, the morphism by means of a fold. In, as you want to show a uh, uniqueness of the special almost orbifold cover, we must study what happens if, a, if some vertex projects onto distinct vertices. And to this end, we have the following dilemma. Suppose um, we have a vertices projected to two distinct vertices, and then the dilemma says, either I can find a common projection, and so actually this does not give a, this vertex phi TB doesn't uh, kind of uh, separates roots, or if we don't have this common projection, both guy cannot fold onto a special almost orbital cover. And so, I mean, if you have a, you know, a, there's at least one of such geometric representation, then this lemma says it uh, is unique. I mean, in, in some sense, this idea is not new. If you have in a free group, fix an element, we know that this, this element is represented by the whole, a whole family of words. Let's say U, X, X inverse, V, Y. I'm sorry, Ederson, we are running out of time, so. Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm just finishing. And the idea is yeah. kind of, in a word, we can simplify many ways. And at the very end, you always arrive at the same point. And so um, this is the idea we do here by means of this, this folding. So, but that, that's it. I mean, oh, I don't okay. <laughs> Thank you very much very for your attention. It's